Hello. Okay, how do I pin? Uh, she's doing it from her phone. Someone's saying hi. Do I push the question mark? She said that she pressed the question mark. Oh, jeez. Um, did you press live? I did. She said she did. She said that once you press live, then there's another one that says live start. Hi! <laughs> hi! How are you? I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you. Wait a minute. I'm trying to figure out how to pin. Do you know oh, how to okay. pin? I think um, you put in the comments. The corner of the screen. In and the comments. You, have, you should have like a little option after you put it in that says like pin to comments. Uh, I, if I put, if I touch comments, do I push the three little dots next to it? Yes. Yes. Push the little dots. It says turn off commenting, turn off requests to go live. Neither of those are right. Nope. Neither of those. Okay. <laughs> Um, and you know, if it doesn't work, it's okay. Okay. Oh, I'll put it on later. I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to figure this out. Um, <laughs> but I here am we are. so <laughs> excited to finally meet you. It's long overdue. We've just been like this. Oh my God. I've, I, okay. Everybody who's watching, um, this is Valerie Carr and she has a new book out. It is called See No Stranger. A memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love. And um, Valerie is a mind blowingly extraordinary person. She is a, um, an activist, a lawyer, a filmmaker. She is one of the most um, magnetic speakers you will ever see. Um, she, I, she wrote this book that um, everybody has to read. Um, it's not only a memoir of her extraordinary life so far, and she is young, um, but it also is a book that is going to help all of us through this incredibly painful, divisive, difficult time. Um, she has actual, actual tangible things that we can do to help heal. And that's what we're going to talk about. I'm okay. Wait. Okay. We'll we'll do it later. Um, okay. Okay. Let's just start. Let's just start at the beginning. Um, let's just assume that people don't know you yet, and uh, you grew up in California, Northern Cal California, on your family farm, yeah. and you were the only Sikh family in the community. One of the only. And um, why don't you why don't you start there? Oh my love, you have been reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my grandfather sailed by steamship from India to California in 1913, so more than a century ago. And I was born on the same land that he farmed. My father was born on that land. And I just remember looking up at the night sky and just being filled with the sense of wonder and belonging. It wasn't long, you know, I'm a little girl going to school where I started to hear the first racial slurs. And so it was, you know, being called a black dog. I remember going um, to my grandfather's room and him scooping me up in his, in his lap and he, and he would just tell me stories. And he would tell me the stories of my sick faith and my sick ancestors. And the, my favorite story was always the origin story, Guru Nanak's story. Uh, Guru Nanak lived uh, 550 years ago. He was the founder of the Sikh faith. You might notice us, but Sikhs keep their hair long as part of our faith, and men wrap their long hair in turbans. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our founder uh, uh, had a revelation, like all of these great wisdom traditions, how it begins with a wonderstruck moment where he uh, said the words, Na ko beri nei bagana. Na ko beri nei bagana. I see no stranger. Oh. I see no enemy. We belong to each other. We are one. I can look upon any face around me and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. You are a part of me I do not yet know. And my grandfather used to say, you know, this love that Guru Nanak called us to, it, it is love is dangerous business. You know, in America, they say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'll talk, 
no action. <laughs> but the love that Guru Nanak called us to, it was a dangerous path because if I see you as my sister, then I must be willing to let your grief into my heart. And I must be willing to fight for you in the face of injustice. I must be able to be willing to risk everything. And so six became um, Sant Sapai, warrior sages that we were called to look upon, uh, move through this world with the warrior's heart and the sage's eyes. The warrior fights, the sage loves. So I came to know it as a path of revolutionary love. Wow. And, and honestly, Deborah, in this moment, when I see millions of people in the street right now, grieving for people they don't know, seeing George Floyd as their brother, raging with each other, fighting for each other, rising up, I'm like, that is revolutionary love in action. I feel like well, revolutionary love is the call of our times. Well, that's, that's the thing that's fascinating is that, you know, when we think of love and we talk about treating each other with love, there's, there's this presumption that it's a soft, ethereal thing. Can yeah. you talk about how we should redefine the concept of love into revolutionary love? Yes. Well, I see my mother is here. <gasps> Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the moment that my son was born, he was placed on my chest and I was like shaking and sobbing from that rush of oxytocin, you know, flooding my body. It was delicious. It was delirious. And my mother <laughs> was opening her bag and getting out her doll and troll and getting ready to feed me, <laughs> like feeding her baby while I was feeding mine. Wow. And I looked at my mother and I thought, she has never stopped laboring for me from, from my birth to my son's birth. And she knew what I was just waking up to, that love is more than a rush of feeling. Love is labor. It is, it is fierce, it is bloody, it is imperfect, it is life-giving. Mm -hmm. It's a choice we make over and over and over again. Think about the greatest spiritual teachers of our time, the, the greatest social reformers in history. Anyone who's done the work of caregiving knows that love is not just a single emotion. It's, it's labor that encompasses all of the emotions, right? It's all of the emotions. Yes. Joy is the gift of love. Grief is the price of love. Mm. Anger, rage is the shield of love. Anger protects that which is loved. So I, I think of revolutionary love as what happens. What, love becomes revolutionary when it doesn't have a limit. What if we could love like that? Others who don't look like us, even our opponents and ourselves, those we too often neglect. Uh, Cornel West says justice is what love looks like in public, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> like revolutionary love, I feel like that's, that's what I... Um, want to inspire in all of our hearts so we can keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up because this is going to be one long labor to transition this nation into an anti-racist society. So that's the kind of love I'm talking about. I think that what really struck me was, I mean, you know, our country is, is experiencing trauma, you know, the, right, right now um, it's, it's an exciting moment because it does feel like a seismic change is happening and that is long overdue. Yes. Um, I think that, you know, the protests, they, they, they come with such energy and there has been this, um, this misnomer that rage yes. is, is violence. Yes. And I would love you to talk about how rage plays a vital part in revolutionary love. I always, you know, as a woman, as a woman of color, I was always taught to suppress my rage mm -hmm. in the name of love and forgiveness. You know, to be a good girl, to be polite was not to show your teeth. And we know that, that, that Black people for a long time have told us, bell hooks, that um, we were taught to choke down our rage because mm -hmm. Black people could die if they showed their rage. It was, it, was, it was my mother. You know, I remember breaking my silence around a, a sexual assault. I, I, I tell that story in the book, too. And I couldn't muster that kind of rage for me. But my mother, my mother, it was the first time I could see rage in her eyes as she silenced the rest of the family and said, no, no, not my daughter. She, she will, she will be free. And I began to, to, I learned much later that um, 
you know, neurobiologists, they call oxytocin that, that, that hormone, the love hormone. Right. Oxytocin reduces aggression in the bodies of mammals with one exception. When mothers defend their young, it actually increases aggression. So rage is the biological force that protects that which we love. Oh, right? Right? oh my God, I just got chills. <laughs> I got chills. That's incredible. That's incredible. It's that mama bear rage, right? Yes. That's what we're seeing in the streets. Like if yes. Floyd is brother, if he's son, if Breonna Taylor is sister, if Nina Pop is sister, if, if these, if we're, if we're ex expanding our notion of family to include all of us, then this is a time for rage. And now the question is like, well, how do we harness it? How yes. do we work with it? How do we dance with it? Audre Lorde says our anger is loaded with information and en energy. It's like a symphony. And our job is to listen to it. If we're just inside of our rage, it could, it could just explode inside of us, right? Yes. The, the, the task is not to suppress it or to let it explode. The task is to, tr is to release it and express it in safe containers and then to be able to work with it. Because once it's on the outside of us through art or music or screaming or shaking or yelling or ritual, whatever it is, once, it, once, it, once it's on the outside of us, we can be in relationship with it and we can harness some of that energy for creative work in, in, the, work, in the world. Um, and that's, you know, that there are these 10 core practices of revolutionary love in this book, and rage is one of them, how to work with our rage in this moment. I, that, I mean, again, everybody, this is a new book, See No Stranger. Mm -hmm. um, and it's incredible because you, you worked with researchers and neuroscientists. And so, so these, these are science-based yes. practices which um which i love because i'm a nerd in that way um, <laughs> um so what i okay i have to ask you because revolutionary love requires that we love everybody and that's hard for me yeah and um i i when i read that after 9-11, your family friend was murdered by a white supremacist. Um, and that you ultimately were able to reconcile that and visit him in prison. Um, that is a kind of grace that I don't have yet. Um, but I would love you to talk about that journey because it's it's extraordinary to find love and forgiveness at the other side of it. Well, I, I want to tell you, Deborah. It, it it took um, it took fifteen years before we could reach out to Bobir Sodi's murderer, Bobir Uncle's murderer, Frank Roke. It took fifteen years of grieving and raging and people loving us really well so that we could keep going and keep surviving and keep trying to tell the story. And it was, it was on the 15 year anniversary. I remember standing at Bobir Uncle's memorial and his younger brother, it was right before the 2016 election and his younger brother, Rana turned to me and said, nothing has changed. And I said, well, who, who is the one person we have not yet tried to love? And we called Frank Roke in prison. And at first he was, I was like, this is a mistake. <laughs> there are some things that, there is a limit to love. There are some things you do not do. Yeah. He was, he was talking about how he was angry, uh, that yes, he's sorry for what happened to my uncle, but he was also sorry for the thousands who were killed on 9-11. He wasn't taking responsibility. I just, I felt rage, you know, and I, and I, that was my role to feel rage, to be a guardian for Rana. But because I was playing that role, Rana could just keep wondering and listening to Frank. And he said, Frank, this is the first time I've heard you say you were sorry. And Frank says, yes, I, I am sorry for what I did to your brother. And when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother and I will hug him and wow. I will ask for his forgiveness. And Rana said, we've already forgiven you. Deborah, I couldn't do that alone. 
I couldn't do that alone. I don't know what grace I had in me. I, it, it, it was, it was a moment that was born out of this need to change the story that for so long I had seen Frank Roque as a monster. And in sitting with Bobby, your uncle's murderer and hearing him speak, I could hear the pain in his voice and the suffering beneath the slogans and the, and the sound bites. And I, I learned that there's no such thing as monsters in this world. There are only human beings who are wounded, people who commit violence or participate in oppression out of their own greed or their own blindness or their own insecurity or their own anxiety. And that moment, it, it wasn't for him, it freed me. Like it was freedom from him having any power over me anymore. And now when I look at white supremacists, I can't see them as this one dimensional, like, no, they are deeply human and deeply complex and deeply wounded. And choosing to love them is simply choosing not to become them. And listening to what their, what cultures and what institutions radicalize them. So loving my opponents is not just moral, it's actually strategic, it is pragmatic. It's realizing that I'm very invested in removing this president from power in November, but I'm more interested in changing the conditions that got him there in the first place. So that's what I mean about revolutionary love. It's holding up an, a vision of a nation that frees all of us, even our worst opponents. You say that Black, non-white, and white people have different roles that yes. we are to play in in this labor of revolutionary love can you can you talk about that you know um in that video of george floyd's murder his his public lynching my eye was on the officer but the white officer but mm -hmm. my eye drifted to officer thou the asian american officer who pushed people back and and I watched him and I thought, he's following orders, he's doing his job, he doesn't have blood on his hands, and yet here he was, absolutely complicit. And I thought about how often have we been like Officer Thou? How yeah. often have we, you know, just done, followed our script while the Black people in our lives around us are gasping for breath, either from a deadly virus that has disproportionately killed Black people or from state violence? And I thought about how we've talked about a lot about how to be white allies or even non-black people of color, how to be allies. I think from the indigenous community has given us new language around this. They say it's time to be accomplices, accomplices who conspire with us to break chains of oppression. And what I'm so invigorated by is to see all of these, like never before have we seen so many white people and non-black people of color in the street putting their bodies in front of black yeah. people, in front of an army of police officers, right? There's so many. And I feel like after the protests and after the, the, the chanting, and after the signs, then you go back to your institutions, right? Your, your schools, your families, your homes, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your industries. I think about the film industry. And there is a role that only you can play to transition this country from where you are. The work of anti-racism is generational work. And every single one of us has a role right now. Um, and so for black people, I wanna tell you that you are grieving. We, don't, we can't know what it's like. We can't know exactly the nature of that trauma, but I wanna tell you, we are sitting in the darkness with you and we are taking your hand. And we are saying, you are grieving, my love, but you do not grieve alone. The labor does, is not falling on your shoulders alone, not anymore. There are more of us next to you than ever before. And for the rest of us, oh, think about labor coming and breathing and pushing, breathing and pushing. So what do you need to breathe and how do you need to push in a way that you've never pushed before? You know, right now they're talking in Washington, D.C. about reform um regarding police brutality against black people and you know there's a concern right now because the house the democrats are are working with the black caucus and making a very comprehensive bill yeah. and 
wonderfully, the Republicans in the Senate are working on a bill as well. Um, but that bill has all of the teeth taken out of, yeah. of it. Um, how, how, do we, how do we keep laboring if ultimately it comes down to politics? Oh, it doesn't ultimately come down to politics. Um, I, I mean, Dr. King says like, a law can keep a man from lynching me and that's pretty important. Right. And yet here we are in 2020 where people have found other ways to lynch and other ways to let people be lynched, right? So it's, it's policies and institutional yeah. power, but the deeper shift needs to happen in our ways of being with each other as human beings. And that is a cultural, spiritual sh transformation that happens along with the policy work. Yeah. And I think about how far we've come as a country. On the one hand, if we think about the story of America as a line of linear progress, like that's the story that I had in my mind, like my grandfather sacrificed so that I would. Right. If we think about that, then we are sliding backwards into darkness. But if we think about the story of America as one long labor, then progress during birthing labor is cyclical, not linear. And so this moment feels like 1968. Yeah. And it feels like 1992. But every turn through the cycle gets us a little bit closer to what is wanting to be born. We have a little bit more space for equality and justice. And that means laws and policies, right, that inscribe yeah. equality. But it also means we as people learning how to be people with and for each other. And that's why I feel I'm so inspired by people who are like, I'm going to be an anti-racist, but it's not just an intellectual exercise. It needs to be integrated into your emotional body. It's an orientation to life. It's a way of moving through the world. It's how to stay in that long, long labor. And so my, my offering in this book is to say, is to give people a way to fight for the policies, but also to begin that transformation here and in their circles and in their own lives, wherever they are. Oh my goodness. Um, you, you have experienced so much. Um, you had, you experienced police brutality yourself. Can you talk about that, that episode and, and what you learned from that experience and how it informs the way you view reform going forward? I, um, I want to say as, as before I, I tell the story that I just, you know, I experienced this much of what um, so many people without the kinds of privileges that I have experienced all the time, thinking about the black people in my lives in particular, but I, um, I survived a, a, an in, a moment of police brutality at a protest where I was there as, as a legal observer and uh, a police officer injured my arm and I was kept behind bars for 16 hours, denied legal attention and medical attention. And I could not feel my arm anymore. And I remember um, <laughs> that's when I knew that I had to become a lawyer. Because I thought if, if the state can, can crush us like this, then I needed better tools than a camera. I needed a law degree. And... But that injury created 10 years of, of chronic pain in my body. Oh. It was so difficult to live with that kind of pain. And healing was, was this long journey of returning to my body. When, when I say see no stranger, it's like the world, if we live in a black body or brown body or indigenous body or queer body, the world wants to make us strange to ourselves and sever us from our own selves, our own wholeness. And so healing was this long journey of returning to my body. And in, in that return, I realized that I had to love myself enough to want to heal. I was always comparing my suffering to others, but to love myself enough want to want to heal. And that required me to tap into my rage, that I was just trying to rush to forgive the police officer. <laughs> like I was just trying to rush to say, but I, I, I was bypassing my own rage, the, the rage that my mother showed me that I was worth protecting. I was worth protecting. And once I could tap into my rage for that police officer, then he stopped having power over me. And then 
I became free of the nightmares. And then I began to feel that warrior energy in my own body that I was worthy and I was beloved and I could fight the good fight for myself as well as, as well as for others. And that's what I think I, I want the black people who survived police brutality to know is that you are brave and you are beloved and you are worthy of protecting. And we are here to fight to protect you alongside you. Well, I love that um, in 2016, after the election, you left the country and you went to Central America, up into the mountains with your family, and you birthed this. <laughs> and um, you were also growing a baby inside of you at the same time. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's something, there's something magical about this book, everybody. Um, you, you, you really want to just sit quietly and read this book. Um, and and I, I think the fact that you were up in the mountains in Central America and your family had to use ropes to pull up <laughs> you know, a hundred different journals of yours in order for you to do the research and that they built a desk for you to write at every day and you were, you know, in the middle of nature. I think, I think you feel that in this. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, everybody, please, please, please get this. Buy it for your friends and for your family members. Um, Valerie is just pure inspiration and light and ferocity and um, wisdom. And <laughs> Valerie, I, I, I can't even I can't even tell you what it means to me to to be able to talk to you. Um, you have <laughs> you have you have really been a light, um, a source of. I always know that if I need any uplifting, all I have to do is to go to you. And, um, and I feel very grateful. I feel very grateful to have this, this dialogue with you. Deborah. I just, I feel it back. I feel like you have been in my life <laughs> on the screen, you know, from afar, just providing, like provide, giving me joy and giving me inspiration in everything that you do in your art. And now to have you in my life and to feel this kind of sisterhood and solidarity, it is such a gift and it keeps me going. It makes me brave. So thank you, my love. Well, I'm, I'm sending, laboring along along your side. I will labor. I will labor alongside with you, and I will <laughs> I will become revolutionary in my loving because <laughs> of you. And um and good luck with this. And I can't wait where it, uh, when I can finally hug you in person. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Oh, and we're launching book clubs. We're long, launching oh. virtual book clubs. So if you go to seenostranger.com. You can get the book and you can sign up for the club and we'll be hopping in. We'll have guests coming in so we can read together and journey together. There you go. See <laughs> no stranger.com. That's where yes, you can get it. everything. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Yes, I do.